say yes, we say yes, we say yes, we surrender, we surrender, we surrender, we surrender, we surrender. Let your will be done. Let your will be done in my life. May your will be done. Let it be your words. Let it be your will. Let it be your love. Let it be your action. I want you to to hear me. I want you all to listen. Your freedom, our freedom, that is our right. Freedom is the right of every son and daughter of God. Embrace that. I'll give you a second. Freedom is your right right as a child of God so if you suffer hear me if you suffer from any kind of oppression I'm going to give you a list general list some of the oppression and the bondage that we suffer from hear me sickness and disease it's bondage it's an oppression some of us suffer where we are tormented by spirits, unclean spirits. The Bible speaks about demons, unclean spirits. That is also a bondage. But now listen to me. As a child, as a son and daughter of God, Christ bought us back. God brought us back from sin through the sacrifice of his son. His blood paid for us to be back. And because of that, it is our right to be free. So today I want to tell you this. If you have been suffering if you have been bound, if you have been oppressed because of sickness, disease, unclean spirits, tormenting you, binding you, you've been in bondage, today I want to let you know that your obedience, hear me now, this is the key, our obedience unlocks the door to our liberation and our deliverance. So, so today, if you want to be free, if you, if you want to be free, it's your right to be free. But your obedience, our obedience, our obedience is the door. It unlocks the door to our freedom. Why is it that so many sons and daughters of God are bound? I was listening to this the other day, and I heard a preacher say he does not believe that a true son and daughter can be bound. I say, okay, you, you don't have to believe that. But all I need to do is introduce that man to a believer that's bound. Many of us have gone through our very own phases and stages where we knew we were bound. Listen, I gave my life to the Lord Jesus when I was 17 years old. That's not because my mama made me. It's not because someone forced me. It's said, say Jesus now. <laughs> like, 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 forced me to make him come into my life. I did that when I was like 12, 13. I did, that did happen too. But when I was 17 years old, no one made me. I, I welcomed, I invited him, I, I confessed him, and I, and I realized I needed him. On that day at 17 years old, I was born again, saved from eternal con condemnation in hell. But let me tell you this, after that, God needed to deliver me. He did. I mean, I mean, I said yes to God, and it was amazing because I felt him. It was overwhelming. But I struggled in my walk with God, and later on, God showed me because I was still bound in certain areas. So I, I just thought it all happens at once. It'd be amazing if it all happened at once. But any person who's walked with God will tell you, it doesn't just all happen at once. But, but, but God is faithful to complete the work that he has started. That's what Paul says in the book of Philippians, that he is faithful to complete 
the work that he has started. So today I want to tell you, today is a day where God's going to complete something in us. Today, as we were here, God showed me that the atmosphere, the ground that we're standing on right now has a special anointing for deliverance, for freedom. So as Pastor Michael was saying, maybe you'll come in here and, and, and this will be the only time that you come in here. You might not ever come back. It does not matter. Today, God has set a time. He has set a moment. He destined for you to be here today so that you can receive the word of God from here so that you can be free. Today is a day of freedom. Today is a day of deliverance. This is the last day that you will be bound. How can you say that? Because that is the power. That is the power of our salvation. That is the power of Christ's blood. Let me tell you this. His blood was enough. His blood was enough. There is no bondage. There is no sickness. There is no disease. There is no demon. There's no unclean spirit that is more powerful than God. So what I want you to, to do is this. Today I want you to think of this. If there's an area of bondage in your life, Today is a day that you can be free. Jesus said this, you shall know the truth, and the truth will. I'm going to say in the O King James Version, so it's more powerful, and the truth shall set you free. <laughs> you shall be free. It just got that more powerful. You got it, right? It's the truth. It's the truth. In other words, what has us bound? The lie. The truth sets us free from the lie that we belong or from the lie that we can't be free. Amen? Let's go right into God's word. You're all standing. You guys could just stay standing with me. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Let's go through the protocol. I'm Ezekiel Velez. Yeah, big wooty do. Praise the Lord. I pastor this amazing church with my beautiful wife, our first lady. Thank God for all the pastors, all the volunteers, everyone watching. We love you. But okay, let's go into God's word. I thank you all for being here. I got, I got, I got, I got so much stuff for you. I mean, I've got an iPad with notes. I have, I have my phone with a picture of another verse that's not in my notes for you. I have a paper with three other verses, and, and then I have a Bible. Watch out. Watch out. I got, I, got a, I got a Bible here. Yes, this is a real Bible. It has a cover. It has a back. It is for, for everyone wondering, what is that thing? It's a, it's a book. It's the Bible. Look at it. It's the Word of God. <clears throat> How do we know about the power of our salvation? It's the word of God. It's not some awesome thought that someone had one day. It's not, it's not positive thinking. It's not good talking. It's the word of God. It's the word of God. I got no one to talk to. Let me tell you this. If you got yourself a Bible, oh, trust me, you, you'll have heaven and more to speak to you. It's the word of God. It's the word of God. It's the word of God. I want to repeat this again before we begin. As a child of God, it is your right to be free. It is our right to be free. It's your right to be free. I'm going to say it again. It's your right to be free. It's your right to be free. The reason why I feel to say that is because there's, there's someone, there's people in here that have accepted their condition. Not in Christ. Not in Christ. I don't care what you did if you were even the cause of some of the condition that you experienced. You have a past that, 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 that had consequences, and as a result, it brought some type of bondage to you. The Bible tells us this, that when we, when, we, when we call upon the name of the Lord, we shall be saved. The Bible also tells us this, that whoever comes to Christ is a new creation in him. The old is gone, and, and, and before us is the new. So, so, so salvation, this is, why, this is what we're talking about, substance. It's, it's the power of our salvation. There's so much to our salvation that we never touch. Because we stand at the surface. We stand at the surface of salvation. Let me tell you this. I don't want to say that the love of God is superficial. No. But the love of God is at the forefront of our salvation. But if we could get past the surface, past the forefront, there is so much more. Past the surface of God's love is the Holy Spirit. That's, that's just past the surface. 
where, where God invites all of us by his love, and it's great. But just past that is an amazing mount of God's Holy Spirit that says, I want to be in you. I want to fill you. I want to overflow. I want to bear fruit in you. And from the fruit of the Spirit comes love, joy, peace, kindness, gentleness, self-control. And also from my Spirit are the gifts, the manifestation of the Spirit. That is the beauty of faith, of healing, of miracles, of knowledge, of wisdom, of healing the sick, of speaking in tongues, of interpreting the tongues. That's all past the surface. But no, we just talk about the forefront, which is love. And, and it's wonderful. And, and, and then we come to church. And, and that's great. You feel that love. And many of us get stuck in just love. But God says behind the love is power. Behind the love is power. Behind the love is healing. Behind the love are miracles. We're ending religious activity. And being satisfied with just going to church. And we're going deep. We want to have a relationship of substance. Here we go. Exodus chapter 16. This whole series is coming from the story of the Old Testament about the children of Israel coming out of Egypt. We're looking at Exodus chapter 16. So you know, when you read Exodus chapter 16, the children of Israel have left Egypt. Praise the Lord. They come out 430 years later. 400 years were in bondage. The other 30 years were under that great reign with Joseph, and they had favor there, and they multiplied. Pharaoh gets scared, enslaves them for 400 years. But God sends Moses to deliver them out, and he says, I, I drew you out on eagle's wings. I carried you out, and I brought you to myself. He didn't bring them to church. He brought them to himself. Our salvation is not about getting addicted to church. It's about being addicted to God. And so they're out. They get out of Egypt, all of them. And then they're in this wilderness, and in front of them is a sea. And they get really scared because why? Pharaoh changes his mind. The enemy will always change his mind. Let me tell you this. Whenever the enemy lets you go, he always comes chasing after. You need to know that. We're going to read that in Scripture in the New Testament. He'll let you go. But then he'll come looking. He'll come looking to see if you want to go back. He'll come looking to see, oh, okay, you tried that God stuff. You want to taste back. You want to taste this again. And, and, and if you let him, you, next thing you know, you're back in bondage. And when you go back in bondage, again, it's always harder to try to get out again. How many of you have this testimony? Oh, I ain't doing that again. I, you know, I got Jesus. And you get set free. But then you know what? Enemy, you know, he tempts you. He, tests, he, he tempts that palate. He tempts your palate to see if you still got a taste for it. And you know what? You end up, we end up falling back into sin. And then we say, oh, God, please help me. And then, you know what? It's almost harder to get out a second time. Now, if you slip back in, we all know it's even harder to get out a third time. You slip back in, it's harder to get out a fourth time. We all been there. It always gets harder, and there's a reason why. Scripture literally tells us why. We'll get to that. But Satan's like, you guys want to come back? He comes chasing. God, God puts a pillar of cloud. His presence becomes a pillar of cloud and a pillar of fire, separating Egypt from them. The people are like, oh, man, we should have stood in Egypt and just died. Their enemies are coming after us. Moses preaches, I mean, he didn't have no other sermon. He's like, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. God says, bad message, Moses. Why are you crying out to me? Tell the children of Israel to go forward. Don't stand still. Move forward. He, 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 he puts his, the rod over the sea. It opens up. They walk through on dry ground. Amazing. It, the Egyptians come after them. What happens? God drowns them. Now. I mean, this is awesome, right? Isn't this awesome? When you, th this isn't all in Exodus chapter 14. When you read Exodus chapter 15, when you read, you see it's, you, you'll see it in your Bible. It'll say, Song of Moses. Why? Because Moses rejoiced and he gets everyone to sing with him. Why? They're rejoicing because their enemy has drowned. Wonderful. You keep, you keep reading, then it turns from the Song of Moses to the Song of Miriam. Miriam said, hey. You ain't going to sing this song by yourself. I want to lead the second song. She grabs her tambourine. She starts singing too. <laughs> now everyone's singing with Miriam. And it's like, yes, God, you're awesome. You're so great. Hurrah. Ha, ha. Look at the Egyptians. That's chapter 15. Now we get to Exodus chapter 16, verse 2. 
Now, this is, has dr- drove me insane as I have read the Bible and read this passage over and over again. Because I'm like, look how amazing God is. Look, the people are so excited. But look, in a moment, in a moment, in a moment, look, they go from singing to this. Exodus chapter 16, verse 2. In the desert, in the desert, ha, desert. This is where the enemy comes after us, in our desert. What's the desert? The desert is when you come out of bondage, and it's the place in between the land of promise. We never go from bondage right into the land of promise. Why? Because there's so much work that God needs to do in the middle. He needs to complete the work that he started at your deliverance, and he really needs to free you in the desert so that when you get to the promised land, you don't sabotage everything that he wants to bring you into. He's got to clean you out in the wilderness. He's got he's to fix you up in the wilderness. He's got to work on that character. He's got to take stuff out of you. He's got to put stuff in you. All of that happens where? In the desert, in the wilderness, in the middle. So in the desert, the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. Wait a minute. They were just singing. How fast we go from worshiping God to complaining, complaining to our pastors, complaining to our parents, complaining to our best friends, complaining to our husband and wives. Wait a minute. You were just singing about how awesome God is. So why are they grumbling? Why are they complaining? The Israelites said to them, this is crazy. How do you sing a song about God setting you free from Egypt, drowning your enemies, worshiping God, and then say this, if only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. Those are one of those, when your mind blows, but it's not good, it's like, I just, I just don't get it. How? There we sat, and look at this, see, Basically what they were saying, you should have just left us in Egypt and, we, and let us just die there. We would have been good. Just Why would you bring us out here? Because look at this. There we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted. Wait a minute. You just went from worshiping God to asking, to telling Moses, you should have just left us there because the food was good. The enemy will always test your palate. He will always test us by our current appetite to see, oh, you want to walk with God? You know how he'll test if that's true? What you like to eat? And I'm not talking about physical food. What you like to do? What you like to think about? What you like to meditate? Oh, you want to do this God thing? Well, let's take a look at your palate. And that's where the test really begins because now you're in the middle of the wilderness. Do I really want to trust that God will be my provision or do I go back to what I'm used to eating? And look, there we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted. But you have brought us out into this wilderness to starve this entire assembly to death. Then, then, then the Lord said to Moses, oh, he said, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. I'm going to rain down bread from heaven. He goes, the people are to go out each day and gather enough for that day. And this way, I will test them and see whether they will follow my instructions. All right, here's my title, The Power of Deliverance. And you guys may be seated. The Power of Deliverance. As I'm looking at this, th- these passages of scripture, and as I told you, this whole entire series, Substance, where we're learning about the power of our salvation, is coming based from the story of the children of Israel. We spoke about the power of salvation. We spoke about the power of baptism. And now we're speaking about the power of deliverance. So when I look at this passage of scripture, in my mind, the children of Israel are already delivered. They're already delivered. Why? Because they're out of Egypt. Right? So they're delivered. I would also say they're also delivered. Why? Because they passed through the Red Sea and their enemy who came chasing after them got drowned. So, I mean, for me, they're, they're delivered times too <laughs> up until this point. But then the minute they see that there's no food for them, rather than them thinking, well, God, man, when you got ready to deliver us, you went into Egypt and you turned it upside down. 
You loved us so much that you, you came with these wild plagues on our behalf. I mean, also, I mean, you opened up the sea for us. Like, that's not normal. That's not something you see every day. Like, you just opened the sea on our behalf. So, in other words, they saw God move already, and they saw that God had miraculous signs and wonders. So rather than when they get to a place in the wilderness where there's no food, rather than thinking, look all that God has done already, surely we can put faith and he will provide food. No, immediately they think, let's go back. You should have left us there. At least we got to eat there. Now we're going to just die out here, Moses. So as I was thinking about this, I said, what causes a person? What causes a people? What causes us at times after all God has done? After his mighty hand moving, and there are things that we know, say, you know what, that was just God. I I really can't explain that one, but that was just God. God saved me. He saved me from the car accident. He saved me for this. He kept me out of trouble. I realize now that that was God. So after seeing the hand of God, how is it that our minds think of going back, doubt that God can do it again, or don't think, well, you know what, if I trust God for this, he'll show up. No, our minds don't think like that. And so looking at this, I said, God, I thought they were free already. And as I'm looking at this scripture, it makes sense to me. And then I was able to see this. God, yes, indeed, delivered them from the land of Egypt. But the purpose of the wilderness was this. Now God needed to deliver the Egypt out of them. I'm going to give you a minute to process that. It's it's one thing. God took them out of Egypt, and that was great. That is the beginning. That is the first thing, the disconnect, the disconnection from the place. And many times, this is how God begins, hear me, begins our deliverance. He has to separate you. He has to disconnect you. Uh, the, the story of Pastor Tanya, and she'll share this with you. When she was, she, she didn't always live here in the United States. She grew up in Puerto Rico. And, and, and in there, and she, you know, she went through her life. And, 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 and when God, when she knew that she needed to look for God, you know what God let her do? To disconnect completely from the land so that what? He can separate separate her, disconnect her, so that he could really begin to work in her. And it was beautiful. She needed to be disconnected. I want to tell you this. Sometimes God needs to disconnect us. Sometimes physically, he'll disconnect us from places. He'll disconnect us from from sometimes people. He'll disconnect us from friendships. That has to take place. But hear me, that's only the beginning of true deliverance. Then after that, the real stage of deliverance begins. Because God's like, okay, I got them out the place. Now comes the time where I need to take the place out of them. Now, I don't know how many of you heard some kind of variation of this. You could take a man out the ghetto faster than you could take the ghetto out the man. See, everyone's like, that, that's right. Praise the Lord. He preached. Yeah, I know some ghetto people. God took them out, and they up in here in my nice neighborhood, and they are that get. They need to get that ghetto out. They should have just, what do we say? Oh, they should have just stood back over there if they're going to bring all that nonsense over here. What are we talking about? Yeah, they left the place, but they brought the place with them. And this is what happens to many of us. God, he pulled them out of Egypt, but the appetite of Egypt was still inside them. And true deliverance is not just God taking you out of a place. It's taking the place out of you. And many of us, we get saved. We get disconnected. But the thoughts are still there. The desires are still there. And God says, I want to bring you into total deliverance. Him disconnecting you from the place, him disconnecting you from the people, him disconnecting you from the atmosphere. Some of us, God took you out the club. Awesome. That was a great start. But you know, you're like, I don't go to the club no more. I don't go to that place because when I go to that place, I act a fool. But I am saved. I am sanctified. And I am Holy Ghost filled, right? And, and, and that's good. You are. He gets you out the place. But you know, the minute somebody else drives up and they got that crazy music bumping, you in your car like, oh, God. Oh, Lord. God, help me. Oh, Lord, why? That's because he got you out the place, but he's still working on getting the place out of you. God want to set you free. You start doing the Watusi up in there. God like, he only started by disconnecting you from the place. Now it's time to get the place out of us. 
This is the same thing where someone's in bondage in a harmful relationship. It's not godly. How hard sometimes is it to disconnect? It's crazy. Many of us have loved ones, friends, sisters, daughters, where you can see the, the, the woman and you know that the relationship is terrible, it's bondage. Half the time it's in fornication. It's like that's not even of God from the get-go. But then there's bondage, there's abuse, mental abuse, uh, uh, the verbal abuse, sometimes physical abuse. And it's crazy how sometimes it's so hard to get that girl out the place. And everyone around, like, she need to get out the place. She need to get out from that relationship. And then this is a crazy thing. If, 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 if glory to God, she gets out of the place, it's in insane when you start to try to restore that girl, when you try to counsel that girl, because this is what many times you will see, that through counseling, even though that person's out the place and they're in a better place, they're still like, man, but I miss him. He hit me, but he loves me. He have talked down to me, but I know deep down. And it's like, wow, we got them out the place, but the person is still on the inside of them, because let me tell you this, when two come together, they become one. And, and, and so that's what happened with the children of Israel. They were married in Egypt for so long that they became one. And God said, I got to separate you, and now I got to free you. And God said, that food, that taste that you have in your belly for Egypt, here's the thing. This is how true deliverance happens. It's not just about taking that out. It's about taking that out and putting something else in. And what is that? That's why God said, oh, you, you, want, you want food from Egypt? You, 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 your, bu your belly's bubbling and you're craving the pots of meat? He said, tomorrow I'm bringing bread for you. I'm going to change that appetite. I'm going to fill you up. I'll make a statement, and we'll get to it a little bit more de in detail in just a little bit. But here, true deliverance is not just about taking something out. It's about filling back in. God, th that's how God works. This is our problem with us. We take stuff out, and we leave it empty. And, and, and if we don't, look at this. If you don't take the food of Egypt out your belly and put the bread of God's provision in, eventually you'll get so hungry that you'll go back to the food of Egypt. That's why many of us fall back into our bondage. Because we ask God to deliver us, he opens the door, he sets us free, it comes out, but then we don't fill it. Later on, Jesus would say, I am the bread of life. I am the bread that has come down from heaven. And, you know, in the olden times, your ancestors ate manna, but I am the bread of life. So when God sets you free, we need to be filled with God. And so, this whole service already, we've been feeling the spirit of God's power towards deliverance and liberation. I ain't telling the worship team, hey, Amanda, you need to sing about and bring that deliverance down today. <laughs> I ain't telling them sing tremble because I'm preaching. Pastor Mike gets up here and he starts speaking about God setting us free. That's the spirit of God. I didn't tell nobody but my wife what I was preaching about. And yesterday I told her, I said, I love, I'm preaching about deliverance tomorrow. She's like, oh, my God, I was telling Josh we need to do a Bible study about that. <laughs> but that's because God has anointed this moment for true liberation. I want to tell you this. Jesus had a ministry of liberation. We, we always just talk about his ministry of love. Yes. That was at the forefront of it. But Jesus had a ministry of liberation. Now, this is stuff that church don't talk about anymore. Why? Because it's scary. <laughs> don't be talking about no demons up in here. People are going to get scared. They ain't never going to come back. No. I want to challenge that and say maybe that's why we never get full. Because we talk about God's love and we talk about God wants to free you from your past. But we never talk about people being filled with the Holy Spirit to keep them so they don't go back. And then we have this revolving door. Because why? We speak about Jesus. We speak about God. We speak about angels. But we never talk about Satan. And we never talk about fallen angels. And we never talk about demons. So I want to say this. If you're new here, this is great. This is how we, we all should have started with this. But we get so scared. But I want to tell you this. Jesus had a ministry of liberation, of setting people free from all their oppressions. Look at this. I got some stuff to read to you, so I'm just going to start reading. I got no points. We're just reading, looking at scripture. Luke chapter 4. This is after Jesus comes out of his wilderness. There's always testing in the wilderness. Even Jesus. We read that Jesus was baptized 
And if you keep reading the Gospels, you'll see that after he was baptized, he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Now, I want to tell you this. After Jesus' baptism, the Bible says when he came out, the Spirit of God descended upon him like a dove. It wasn't a dove, but it was like a dove. That's only a simile. It's a metaphor. It came down. But it was the Holy Spirit. And then a voice from heaven said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Then later on, John said, who you see the Spirit descending upon, and we talked about this in youth or Bible study, can't remember, who you see the Holy Spirit descending upon and remain. It wasn't a come and go moment. The Holy Spirit didn't come, tickle Jesus, he get goosebumps, and then it went away and flew off somewhere else. No, the Holy Spirit came on Jesus and remained on Jesus, and after that, Jesus was filled with the Holy Spirit like never before. Yes, there was a moment in time when Jesus himself was baptized with the Holy Spirit and full power and authority, and it's a beautiful passage in Scripture because you see for the first time the three union of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit all at once. You see Jesus coming up out of the water. You see the Holy Spirit descending, and then you see the voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. It's a beautiful picture. I left my rag home. Tissue ain't helping. I actually left it in my other car, and I went in my car to get it, and it was in the other car. Anyway. It's amazing because that is when, after, hear me, hear me, Jesus is immersed in the Holy Spirit. He is baptized in the Holy Spirit. And by the Holy Spirit is where all his power comes from. If you look at the Gospels, not a a blind eye was opened before this. Nope. Not a miracle was done before this. At most, what you do is see Jesus as a kid in the temple talking. And, and, and now you got to know this. He's talking about the word, the scriptures. They're opening up scrolls. They're talking about it. And everyone's in awe as Jesus is talking as a kid. They didn't realize that the, the scrolls that they were reading, that Jesus was the word of God himself. And the word of God was having a conversation back with them for the first time. And they were blown away by his knowledge and his understanding and his authority. They couldn't understand it because they didn't realize it was the word of God. The word became flesh, the Bible says in John, and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. They had no idea who they were speaking to. But after that, Jesus goes into his wilderness. The wilderness is always a testing of your appetite. If you didn't know this, what happens in the wilderness? Jesus is not playing jump rope. He's not playing doing 5K runs in the mud. He's not physically getting fit. No, he's in fasting and prayer. For how long? 40 days. Yes, absolutely. Jesus ate no food for 40 days. A lot of times we say, well, why do we fast? I don't get it. Why do we starve ourselves? It's not about starving yourselves. It's about this. Controlling the flesh. Suppressing the gratification of your appetite for spiritual purpose and closeness to God. So when you fast, it's not about trying to lose 10 pounds. That's only a byproduct depending on how long you fast. But now if you're just not eating so that you can lose weight, don't tell me you're fasting in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. No, you are just starving yourself to try to get skinny. That's not what God did. That's not what Jesus did. He fasted. He deprived himself from eating so he could get closer to God. And at the end of his fasting, guess who appears? In the wilderness with Jesus. Why? Because there's always a testing of your appetite in the wilderness. It was Satan himself. And he appeared to Jesus after his fast. And he says, why don't you turn these stones to bread? And then Jesus looked around and said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Why did he? Now this happens when Jesus is done fasting. But Jesus is even closer to God than he was before. Why did he tempt him to eat bread? If you fast for 40 days, you know what happens to your stomach? Yeah, that's why you lose weight. Ultimately, the longer you fast. But your stomach shrinks. Do you know what happens when bread goes into our stomachs? It expands. And so since Satan couldn't touch Jesus while he was fasting, he tried to tempt him after he fasted, knowing that if Jesus would have turned these stones into bread, because Jesus technically could have eaten because he broke the fast. But if he would have eaten the bread after the fast, he would have killed him because the bread would have expanded, blowing up his stomach. Jesus said, I can eat, but I'm not going to now put back into my stomach what I just 
show that I had power of now that I can. That's a powerful teaching in itself. I'm not touching this if I let it go for so long. And Jesus did not fall to the temptation that the enemy offered him. He was testing his appetite. But after that, he comes out of that. And you know what Jesus does? He goes right back into Galilee. Galilee was a big place, had many cities, many towns. And in Galilee, Galilee was his hometown where he was raised, Nazareth. And so Jesus begins his ministry at his home. He goes to Nazareth, but Jesus comes in like a boss. I was reading this, I said, man, Jesus came in like a boss. He was not playing. I'm going to show you how he rolled up into Nazareth. Luke 4 says this. I need a chair. I don't want to take that one. Just come pass me a chair. It says, so he came to Nazareth where he had been what? Brought up. This is where Jesus brought up. Perfect. Just put it right there. It says, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read. So it was not anything irregular for Jesus himself to be in church, so to say. Now, on the Sabbath day, and it says this, that he stood up to read. And what did he do? He's reading from the scriptures, which were scrolls. It says, and he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah was a prophet that lived approximately 700 years before the time of Jesus. So he opens up the book. He opens up the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. What place? Because it's not going to say it here, but so you know. In our Bibles, if you open up to the book of Isaiah, someone do it. Who has a Bible? Just someone get in an app to confirm this. Isaiah 61. Isaiah 61. Thank you so much. Now I got more tissue than, oh, perfect. This is a rag. I love this. Thank you. That's fine. Thank you. That's fine. He opens up Isaiah from 61 in our Bibles. And look, he gets up and he reads. He goes, the Spirit... This is Luke 4, verse 18, that we're reading. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to who? To the poor. He has sent me to heal what? The brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. So he reads from Isaiah the scroll, which in Isaiah is speaking about the anointed one coming to set captives free. And look what it goes on to say. Then he closed the book. Is that he gave it back to the attendant. Says he sat down. And look, he sits down and says, and all the eyes who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. They're like, okay. <laughs> and then it says in verse 21, and he began to say to them, today, this scripture written 700 years ago by the prophet Isaiah is fulfilled in your hearing. And he dropped the mic. He grabbed the Old Testament prophecy, which spoke of the coming Messiah being the anointed one who would be filled by the Spirit because Jesus was Spirit-filled. And the Messiah was the anointed one to set captives free, set captives free heal the brokenhearted, all that stuff that we just read. And he basically said, this thing is being fulfilled right now before your very own eyes and your ears. Now, at first... As you, if you keep reading, some of them were in awe at what he said. He continued to talk a little bit more. And as you keep reading, Luke chapter 4, they pushed him out of Nazareth. They rejected the truth that they just heard. And so much that it says this, they pushed him to the edge of a cliff, almost throwing him off. But Luke 4 ends with Jesus just walked right through and continued on his business. They rejected the truth. They refused the truth. And as a result, many in Nazareth stood bound. Th this is where we get the other scriptures in the Gospels where Jesus says, a prophet is not welcome in their own home. He literally said that after this while he was in Nazareth. And other passages of scripture tell us this, that when he was in Nazareth, he couldn't do much work because of their unbelief. And he continued. So there you see 
Jesus announced his ministry, not just of love, yeah, it was there, but of setting captives free. It was prophesied that the Messiah would have a ministry of deliverance to those that are bound. This was prophesied long before Jesus got here. And then Jesus says, you hearing this, it is going to be fulfilled. And Jesus begins his ministry. Look at Matthew verse 4. It says this. So after he leaves Nazareth, he continues in Galilee to some other towns. Verse 23 says this of Matthew 4. It says, Jesus went throughout Galilee teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming, look, the good news of the kingdom. Jesus preached the good news. You read it, Jesus was preaching the good news of the kingdom and doing what? And healing every disease and sickness among the people because he had a ministry of healing and setting people free. We need to preach about this kind of Savior, this kind of Messiah. This is what's attached to our salvation. As a child, as a believer, it is your right to be free and to be made whole. Healing every disease and sickness among the people. It didn't matter what it was. Jesus wasn't like, okay, depending on the severity of this one, is this a flu or is this just a fever? Is this just a mild headache? You know, is it a demon, two demons? And depending on how that goes, you know, do I need more people on my side? No, every kind of disease, it did not matter. It says news about him spread all over Syria and the people brought to him all who were, in, were ill and various diseases, those suffering with severe pain. I mean, if you just had pain, you could be set free. I want to speak to the person here. Someone told me this. So I've just been suffering with, with like a spasm, like a muscle knot for a month now. I want to tell you that Jesus has the power to heal that too. Many times we're like, yeah, I just don't feel good. And we continue our day, yeah, it's just going to be a bad day. And we don't realize that it's not just the love of God that Christ came for us to know, but it's for us to, uh, to know and experience the healing of God. So headaches in Jesus' name have to go to muscle spasms in Jesus' name have to go to pains in the body in Jesus' name have to go to every kind of disease. Don't just say, okay, yeah, take your Tylenol, take your Benadryl, non-drowsy, whatever you need to do. Take it, but in Jesus' name be made whole. Next time you take a Tylenol, swallow it down in Jesus' name. <laughs> so news about him spread all over Syria, and the people brought to him all who were ill, various diseases, those suffering severe pain. Look at this. The demon possessed. Oh, I don't believe in de demons. I just believe in angels. Silly. How do you believe in angels? Because the Bible talks about them. So how don't you believe in the demons that the Bible talks about? I just believe in God and Jesus, not Satan and demons. How do you know about God and Jesus? Because of the Bible. And the same Bible speaks about Satan and the demons. Now, let me tell you this. There are some people who are like, oh, yeah, this is the good stuff. Oh, yeah, I've been waiting for, been waiting for pastors to talk about these evil demons. And uh, let me tell you this. There's a point when you're too superstitious. I mean, these are the people that see demons everywhere. God, not here, let me tell you, not every headache is a demon. Yes, a flu may be contagious, but don't be like, I'm not going to get next to them. I don't want a demon flu. Not, not every headache's a demon. Not every flu is a demon. Not every person who doesn't say hi to you, oh, she rolled her eyes at me. I think I saw them black. She may have a demon. This is not to say that. Her eyes didn't go black. She might, but not everyone does. There's the over superstitious, where everything's a demon. It's like, oh my God, I think I saw a demon. You know, like, <laughs> I think I saw one. I think, like, I think I got demons. Like, just, just people like, and this is not to say that someone can't or you can't, but not everything. Some things are just sickness and disease. And let me tell you this. Here's another thing. Let me just throw this in there. Not everyone who has a sickness and this disease is because they committed a sin. Therefore, that's their punishment. One time Jesus healed the man or there was a man who was ill and everyone was like, I wonder who sinned. Was it him or was it his father? Someone had to have sinned because he has this sickness and this is his punishment. And Jesus sent none of them. 
neither this man nor his parents sinned. What's the co- so then why is he sick? He said, don't worry about the cause. Just know it's so that later on the glory of God could be revealed when he is healed. <laughs> sickness is not always a consequence of sin. Though some sickness is a consequence of sin. Not everyone has a demon, though people do have bondage and are possessed. All right? So, so, so we need to find the balance because there's the super, those that are super uh, uh, superstitious, and then there are those that are skeptics that don't believe in none of this. Just read your Bible. When you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all Jesus did when he started his ministry was Preach the gospel, expose people to his love and mercy, like the woman at the will, the Samaritan, and, 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 and the woman caught in the act of adultery. You see that love, but then you also see his power to set captives free. It was the life of Jesus. So it says, those having seizures and the paralyzed, and he healed them. Now look at this. I'm going to show you Jesus' power. Now, now this is the awesome thing. That yes, someone could have bondage by a sickness. Someone can also have bondage by demonic oppression. But but, but look what happens here. Luke 4. Now, now also, many people say here in Luke 4 reveals the reason why Peter denied Jesus. Later on. How many people remember that? He denies him. A lot of people believe that this is the reason why. It says, now he arose... Jesus from the synagogue and enters Simon's house, Simon being Peter. This was Simon Peter. But Simon's wife's mother, so Peter's mother-in-law was sick with a high fever. And they made a request of him concerning her. In other words, they're like, Jesus, look, she's ill, your mother-in-law. It says, so he stood up over her and rebuked the fever and it left her. And immediately she arose and served them. Some people say that Peter denied them because he healed his mother-in-law. It's a bad joke. It's a terrible joke. Don't laugh at that. That's terrible. Why would you laugh? It's just a bad joke. That's not the reason why <laughs> he denied them later on. <laughs> Thought that was funny. Wanted to share. I heard it one time. Made me laugh. <laughs> but the point of this scripture is this. She had a fever. Nowhere says that the fever was because of an unclean spirit. It does not say she had an unclean spirit that gave her a fever. If you actually read some other scriptures, you will see that there were certain people that were ill because of a spirit. But look what happens with the fever. This is just sickness. This is just disease. It says he stood over her and he rebuked the fever. He rebuked us. We understand as we read, he cast out the fever. He called the fever out of her. He rebukes the fever and says, and immediately she arose. So what happened? When he, when, he, when he cast the fever out of her, immediately her position changed. This is what deliverance does to us. When God sets us free, it's always about changing our position. It's always about changing our posture. Let me this. All sickness, all disease, all demonic oppression is to do this. It's to lower our state of being. It's to bring us down. Ultimately, it's to destroy us. Ultimately, it's to, it's to harm us. Ultimately, it's to kill us. And so what sickness does, what disease does, what unclean spirits do, they lower the condition. They lower the state of the person. That is the purpose. The Bible says this in John 10.10, 10, that the thief comes to kill, to steal, And to destroy. That is the purpose of what the thief does. Sickness is a thief to the body where it tries to steal health, lowering the health, lowering the position. Didn't you realize this? All sick people, like, what do they do? They sit down. All sick people, what do they do? They lay down. All sick people, if you don't help them, what eventually happens to them? They become bedridden. And in in those days, they didn't have pills like Tylenol and stuff like this. So when a person got a fever back then, if you didn't care for that person the right way, that person could die. There were a lot of people that died during that time from just fevers. They didn't have all the medicine we had. They didn't have all the understanding that we had. So this was serious. They were scared that it was possible that Peter's mother could die. But immediately, as God rebukes the fever, her position changed. This is what God wants to do in our deliverance. When he sets us free, he wants to take us from where we were at and bring us to an elevated place. And it says this, that immediately she began to serve. Now I'm going to tell you something very powerful about the word rebuke that I never knew. 
But, but let me read a, cu- a couple of more verses, and, and then I'm going I'm to talk about it. It's awesome. Now, as we continue, so what did he do to the fever? He rebuked it. It's a fever, but he rebukes it. Look at this. It says, when the sun was setting, this is verse 40, all those who had any were sick with various diseases brought them to him, and he laid hands on every one of them and healed them. Now look at verse 41, for every one of us who don't believe in demons. And demons also came out of many, crying out and saying, you are the Christ, the Son of God. Let me tell you this. Demons understand. Demons feel. Demons acknowledge. Demons are afraid, and they know the authority and the presence of God. When we sing songs like about tremble and stuff, that's real. Demons tremble in the presence of God. Real presence connected to God. Demons tremble. Now, I want to tell you this. If you ever sat in the presence of God, whether that was you opening the word of God or someone sharing the word of God with you or you coming to church and there was an uneasy feeling within you that, did, that, did, that, that rubbed you the wrong way, it's very possible that bondage on the inside of you is trembling in the presence of God because it knows in the name of Jesus. If Jesus' authority is acted out, that spirit has to go. There have been times where I've been uncomfortable in church. And I'm like, why well, I feel this way? And God's because you God show me you're bound in this area of your life. And the darkness on the inside trembles before. You, start, you ever read a scripture and you're like, oh, I don't like that scripture. You start reading about how the Bible speaks about sexual immorality being sin. And then you read a verse about homosexuality. You're like, no, no, Jesus doesn't love everybody. It makes you uncomfortable. Check yourself because that uncomfortable feeling might just be bondage on the inside of us that is trembling at the word of God. And if we ever receive the truth, we shall be set free. And that has to leave us. You start talking about pornography and people are like, oh, my God, start sweating. (laughs) Start sweating up in the church. Start talking about fornication. People start sweating. Start talking about homosexuality. Start talking about adultery. Everyone's like, this is making me feel uncomfortable. It's very possible if we check ourselves, there is bondage on us from within. Yeah. Trust me, I'm going to be like, hey, whoever's got a demon of this, please stand up. We want to deliver you. I ain't, hey, don't worry. <laughs> we ain't going to do an altar call like that later on. So relax. You're going to be all right. <laughs> We're going to do an altar call, but we ain't going to do it like that. You are safe in God's presence. (laughs) It says, you are the Christ, son of God, and he rebuking them. So what does he do to the demon? He rebukes it. So what did he do to the fever? What does he do to the demon? He rebukes it. And look, he did not allow them to speak for they knew that he was the Christ. He literally said, they, they started to. In other words, they, they, they wanted to manifest. They wanted to call out. They wanted to make a scene. They wanted to make a show. They wanted to be like, no, ew, leave us alone. You know, they wanted to probably spin around. They wanted to probably slither on the floor. And Jesus, just, he just rebuked them, and he forbade them from even speaking. I one time had a conversation with someone. They're like, do you believe in the Holy Ghost? Like, yeah, absolutely. Well, I just don't see everyone slain on the floor in your church. I believe in the Holy Do you believe in the Holy Ghost? Because I've never seen you cast, you know, demons and stuff like that. We never see that. You know, like, what, what do you guys believe? Like, yeah, of course. I just never see that kind of stuff. Well, let me tell you this. While everyone is coming late to church, there's people who are coming early to church, and they are praying. And you know what we are praying? We are praying that there be no demonic manifestations in our church, that there are demons not allowed to speak in our church, that they're not around to slither around and make a show in our church, and we bind them before people even come into the building, and they're subject to the authority of God even before they walk through the door so that people can receive the word of God consciously free of thought and be set free without any show well I didn't think you believed in all of that because I never seen it Jesus literally said and then the demon was like trembling inside I've seen people sitting in this chair trembling can't say a word and you know they're fighting on the inside and while we're worshiping God, you, trust me, if you, got, if you can see what the Spirit's saying, you see it, our leaders see it, our pastors see it, and, and you're able to worship God freely, and, and you know what we're praying? God set them free. 
we're, they're not speaking, they're not making a show because we already spoke against it. God just set them free. Set them free. But let me tell you this. You can receive truth and be set free, or you can, re- you can reject truth and remain bound. That's why many of us come to church in the same condition, just dealing with the same thing over and over again, stuck in the bondage. Here's an awesome thing. He rebuked the fever. Nothing about no demons there, just the fever. And he rebuked the unclean spirits. He did the same thing to both, even though the subjects were different. And I looked at the word rebuke, rebuke. Now, I also know this, that in the Bible, you can read a word in the Old Testament and the Hebrew, see the same word in English, but in Hebrew, it's a different word. Same thing in the New Testament. That's in Greek. And so I went in and I texted my brother Robert, right, last, yesterday, Robert? I said, I need you to research a word for me. I'm looking at Luke chapter 4. Jesus rebukes the fever and he rebukes the demon. Can you check the word in the Greek for me? And I want to know if it's the same word. Why did I want to know that? Because I wanted to see if Jesus did something different in regards to the fever and, and, and different for the demon. And Robert sends me a little thing, makes me laugh, and then he gets back to me. So he says to me, now in the New Testament, in the Greek, you will see when you read in, in, in the Gospels where Jesus rebukes this spirit, rebukes this fever, rebukes that, in the Gospels, that word for rebuke is the same. So it was, I'm like, okay, good, which validated and confirmed that what Jesus did to the unclean spirit and what he did to the fever were the same. It wasn't like, oh, it's a demon, we need something else. Oh, it's a fever, we need something else. Oh, it's a cold, something different. Oh, it's cancer, something different. Oh, it's, you know, a spirit of lust, something different. Oh, it's a spirit of pride. No, it was the same. Now, if you read other books in the Gospels and you see, like, Paul writing to Timothy and he says, don't rebuke an elder. In English, you see rebuke, but in Greek, you see a different word. And that word says, do not strike an elder. So there is a difference. So the, the word rebuke in that sense means do not, uh, to strike. So when it says Jesus rebuked the fever and he rebuked the demons, it does not mean that he struck the fever and he hit the woman and he struck the man who was demon possessed to get it out. Don't get it. I've seen people try to pray for people and I mean they hitting them with jackets, they hitting them with rags, they're throwing them on the floor. No, that's not what it means to rebuke. It, you don't got to strike no one to get a demon out. But here's the real point. It was the same prescription. It was always the authority of Jesus. But this is where it got really good. Because Robert's like, oh, that's an interesting definition. And I was reading it. I'm like, whoa, it sure is. Because the word rebuke as we read it, and you could literally read passages of scripture where it says, and he rebuked and he, and he cast out. Yes, the word rebuke does mean to cast out, and it's awesome. But the word rebuke in Greek comes from this word, epitimao, epitimao. That's the, that's the, when you read the word rebuke in, in, in the gospels, it's epitimao in Greek. And you know what it means? Of course, it has the connotation, Jesus rebuked the fever, he cast it out. He rebuked the demons, he cast them out. But here is the beauty of the word rebuke. The word, that word, epitimal, doesn't just only mean that he took something out. It literally tells us this, that he put something in. It means this. It means to place here, here. Don't start clapping yet. That that was a punchline. Here, Here, the definition. Now you can clap. The word means this. To place and add honor. It, 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 so, so he rebuked the fever, but it also means this, to esteem, to lift up. What did I tell you that disease and demons do? They, dip, they, 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 they always put a person in a position of a lower value. The sick people lay in beds. People who are bound, are, you know, they, they, they're just, they, you know, it, it always devalues. It always debases the person. So when Jesus rebuked fevers and he rebuked demons, he didn't just cast them out, but he esteemed the person back to their proper place. He added, he restored. So rebuking is just not about t- 
taking something out. It's adding value. So this is what God wants to do for you. He wants to lift you up from how low those things brought you so he could esteem you back to the place of honor and restore your worth. That's what true deliverance is about. Remember I told you this. It's not just about taking out the appetite of Egypt. It's about putting in the appetite of God's bread. It's about adding and giving you your honor back from sickness. If you ever looked at someone who is oppressed, it takes away their honor. You see people bound. Now, I'm not saying that every person that you see who has a mental condition has a demon. But there are some demons that produce a mental condition. Just like not every person you see has a demon, but people have demons. But you see that sickness and you see that demons, what they try to do is it devalue and, 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 and debase the value of people. And so when God healed people, he always changed their position. So in our bondage, our bondage is just to take us out of position. But God wants to bring your honor back to you. Your bondage, what puts you in a position of shame, God wants to restore you from that place. Now, a lot of us are saying, oh, that's awesome, but that's Jesus. That's what Jesus does. But I want to tell you this, that as a child and son of God, as a disciple, as a follower, Jesus gave this power to us. He did, yes. I'll read it in the scripture, Mark 16. This is known as the Great Commission. This is after Jesus died, was buried, rose again. He then appeared to his disciples for 40 days. And before he goes up, he says this. He said to them, Mark 16, 15, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Look at that. The ministry that Jesus had to preach the kingdom of God. He commissions them to do the same. And then he goes, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. But whoever does not believe will be condemned. And these are the signs and these signs will accompany those who believe in what? Whose name? My name. In Jesus' name, they will drive out demons. So not in your own name, not in the power of my name, not Pastor Ezekiel, Pastor Tanya, because of who we are. No, but because of the name of Jesus and the authority that was given to us and to you. This power and authority is given to you. In the name, they will drive out demons. They will speak in new tongues. There's just a... a, a, a the manifestation of the gifts of the Spirit. They will pick up snakes with their hands, and when they drink deadly poison, it will not hurt them at all. They will place their hands on the sick people, and they will get well. That's the power of deliverance. So here, if sickness is real, demons are real, bondage is real, but the power of God and authority in Jesus' name is also real, then why so many people are bound? It is because of this truth right here, that the greatest deceit of bondage is denial. That's the greatest deceit of bondage. I'm not bound. I'm not oppressed. I'm good. I'm just sick, and I'm just struggling a little bit mentally, but I'm not bound. That's the greatest. On one occasion, Jesus is speaking in John chapter 8 to Jews who believed in him. He started his ministry, and there's some Jews that are starting to believe. Look at verse 31. Of John 8, the Jews who had believed in Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching. Now, Jesus wasn't walking around with a Bible because he was the word of God made flesh. So whatever Jesus would say, whatever he would instruct, whatever he would do, he goes, if you hold on to that, to my teaching, you are really my disciples. He goes, then you will know what the truth, but the truth comes from the teaching of Jesus who was the word of God. Where does our truth come from? Not from a man, but from the living word of God, from our Bibles that we have today. This truth sets us free. You, then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Then, 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 when? After you what? Hold the teachings. Then they answered him and said, we are Abraham's descendants. They were starting to believe. And he tells them, if you follow my teachings, then you'll be free. And they're like, wait a minute, we are Abraham's descendants and have never been slaves to anyone. How can you say that we shall be set free? In other words, they're like, how are you telling me that we shall be set free? We were never bound to begin with. And Jesus looked at them and said, like, really? Did, your first statement, you are Abraham's descendants. 
You were enslaved by everybody. You were enslaved by Philistines. You were enslaved by Egyptians. You were enslaved by, I mean, the list just goes to Assyrian, Babylonian. You name it. You were enslaved before. But denial is our biggest bondage. Who didn't? Who didn't enslave you is the question. And we're like, no, I'm not bound. I'm cool. I got that under control. I just do that a little bit. I got it under control. I can stop drinking when I want to. I ain't bound. I can stop this fornicating whenever I want to. I'm not bound. I can stop these conversations when I want to. I'm not bound. As you're saying it, you're bound. Here's the most amazing thing. As they were saying, we've never been enslaved to anyone at that time right there. They were under, under Roman rule. As they're saying, we've never been bound, they were bound. <laughs> the biggest deceit of bondage is denial. Jesus is like, man, I ain't even going to go through that list right now of how many times you've been bound. But let me just say it like this. Jesus replied, verily, truly, I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. He's like, I ain't even going to bring up the past because I don't want to hurt your feelings. You definitely forgot about those 400 years slaves in Egypt. I ain't even going to talk about that. I'm not going to talk about the Babylonians. We ain't going to talk about Daniel in that time. I'm not going to talk about the Philistines when they had you. We ain't going to talk about all the enemies that I allowed to suppress you because of your disobedience. I ain't even going to mention that. Let's just talk about present day. Your sin has you bound. Let me tell you this. Obedience. I told you this in the beginning. Obedience is the key that unlocks our freedom. So it's good when we sing songs. Yes. Where's my yes, God, I'll go. <laughs> it's great that you sing that. <laughs> right? We were singing that. That sounds just like Exodus 15 to me. Moses sang, yes. My Miriam sang, yes. And by the time they got to chapter 16, they, want, they wanted to go back. I hope by the time the service is over and we get in our car, we're not going back after we just sang our yes. Let, 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 I rebuke Exodus 16 in our lives right now in the name of Jesus and pray a spirit of Exodus 15 will remain on us like the spirit remained on the Holy Ghost. Like I've re- how the Holy Ghost remained on Jesus. That's the greatest deceit. All right, I got to finish, right? Because we're running on time. But I wish we could just talk all day. <laughs> there are extreme and obvious cases of oppression. You see them in scripture. There are times where Jesus just rebuked the demon, a foul spirit, unclean spirit, and they left the person. But there is this extreme case, and I want to bring it to our attention, where it was extreme and very obvious. I mean, it's the truth. Sometimes we don't always know when someone's bound and struggling. And then there are the times where you just know they in a shadow of a doubt. <laughs> There's manifestation, there's bondage, there's, where you, there's self-harm at times, there's complete rebellion, there's just such darkness that it's obvious. And so Jesus in scripture comes across a very obvious case, and I want to read it to you. It says, they went across, so this is Jesus and his disciples, across the lake to the region of the Gerasenes. When Jesus got out of the boat, a man with a unpure spirit came from the tombs to meet him. This is powerful in itself because we're going to learn that this guy's bondage was heavy. We're not talking about one demon. We're not talking about little demons here. We're talking about an army of demons. But despite, hear me, despite the man being that bound, the man still had enough power to come and position himself before Jesus. I want to tell you right now, there's bondage, there's bondage on the inside of us that tells us, oh, no, you can't go to God. No, I want to tell you, you have the power of free will to still come. You can still come. I don't care the level of bondage. You can still come and present yourself before the Lord. Yes, the bondage on the inside is going to tremble. And yes, the bondage on the inside ain't going to want that. And you're going to hear the voices say, no, don't receive this word. Don't give your life to Jesus. Don't pass to the front. But I want to tell you, dig deep and with your self-will, present yourself to God. If you want to be free, you can come. When Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an unpure spirit came from the tombs to meet him. I want to tell you, that was the man's will, not the demons. The demons wanted to go the other way. 
And no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. Oh, sorry, I skipped the beginning verse, part of that verse. This man lived in the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. Look, this guy was living in cemeteries. Now, if you're going to bind a guy with a chain, it's because he's either going to, he's trying to harm himself or others. So the town also knew this guy was dangerous. It manifested. This is extreme. This is obvious. No one's looking at that boy thinking he's all right. They know this guy is possessed. Clear signs. It says, for he had often been chained hand and foot, and he tore the chains apart. He had extreme strength and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. They couldn't even hold him down. Night and day among the tombs and in the hills, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. Then he shouted at the top of his voice, these are the demons on the inside. What do you want with me, Jesus, son of the most? Most high God, in God's name, don't torture me. Listen, this man never met Jesus before, but the demons knew who was in front of them, and they called him out by name, saying, why have you come to torture me? For Jesus had said to him, come out of this man, you impure spirit. Then Jesus asked him, what is your name? My name is Legion, he replied. The word Legion comes from the, uh, from the Roman, from the, is a, a Roman military term at that time, and a legion in the, in, in, in the Roman government could be up to the minimum 5,000 soldiers. Could be more, depending on the type of uh, artillery men you had there. But at least 5,000 men represented a legion for the Roman soldiers. And so speaking in context of the time, when Jesus says, what's your name? He's like, legion, he replied. And it goes on to say, for we are many. And he begged Jesus. That's crazy. There's at least 5,000 uh, spirits in this man. No one can subdue him. Change can't hold him. But this spirit before Jesus is begging Jesus. That goes to show you, it does not matter if it's one demon, it doesn't matter if it's five thousands. None, none, no one, no demon, no unclean spirit, no fever, no cancer, no demonic principality has power against Jesus. It begged again and again like a whimpering, weak spirit. It, it, it was strong before men, but it was weak in the presence of Jesus. I know our bondage has made you feel weak, but in God's presence, it stands no chance. Stands no chance whatsoever. I, again, as a son and daughter of God, you have the right to be free, and God has the power to free you. Now, I want to tell you this. This is the only time that Jesus asked the name of a spirit. One time. Read the Gospels. He, he would go into towns. I mean, hundreds of people were set free. This is the one time in spirit that Jesus asked the name. And I believe the, there's a reason why. Because some of us say, man, God's just calling me to do deliverance on people. I'm going to set them free. And, they, and, 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 and I, I mean, there's some of us, we just get beyond superstitious. What's the name? What's your name? What's your name? Demon, what's your name? What's your name? Charmander? I couldn't in the name of Char Charizard come out. Pikachu in the name of whatever. I mean, I mean, I mean, what's your name? What's your name? What's your name? <laughs> that would be a crazy demon name. Charizard. Sound demonic. <laughs> My mommy did not let me watch Pokemon when we was growing up. I'm just saying. <laughs> It's the one time that Jesus asked for the name. Why did Jesus ask for the name? Well, let's, let's talk about some truth here. One, it did not matter the name against Jesus. We ask people their name so we can know their rank. <laughs> What's your name? What's your position? All that kind of stuff like that. And so it's important to us because, oh, oh it's pastor, it's deacon, it's prophetess, you know. I mean, of course we have order, senior pastor, executive pastor. But depending upon it, there's authority that they carry, right? And so because of that, then we react different to people. But Jesus didn't need to know the name of the demon because as if the demon said, well, my name is this or my name's that, then Jesus would be like, oh, we need backup. <laughs> De depending your position and rank depends what Jesus would need to go get somebody else. No, that's not the reason why. It did not matter what it was, fever, 
Demon, one demon, 5,000. That did not change. We realize, and when you read too, after he says, oh, it's legion, which we know it's at least 5,000, Jesus didn't do anything different. He just cast it out. So Jesus didn't need to know the name so that he could know the rank so that he could possibly change the prescription. No, it would be the same. But I believe the reason why Jesus asked his name was so that we can highlight and see that when the man said legion, it revealed the magnitude and the amount of bondage, but then to show that Jesus' name was still powerful. Because if we never had this passage in Scripture, think about this. If we never had this passage of Scripture, and we just read that Jesus went to the man with the unclean spirit and rebuked him, or Jesus went to the boy and he rebuked the spirit, right? And, and then we live in real day, and then we come across someone who is bound, and then we realize, wow, this bondage is heavy, and then we don't have a passage in Scripture telling us that Jesus at one time, with one command, rebuked. Rebuked 5,000, if not more, then we would be stuck with, and be like, oh my God, what do we do now? So I believe the reason why it's in scripture is so that we can see the picture that it does not matter the amount, it's still Jesus' name. Later on after this, he casts them out. And you know what the spirits do? If we keep reading, I know we're short on time, but it's good. Okay, look at this. The demons beg for him not to remove them from the town. Look, verse 10. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send them out of the area. He's going to cast them out of the person, but they begged to stay in the area. This is important. I will end this sermon because of time, but I honestly don't care right now because we need to hear this. It says, a large herd of pigs was feeding... On the nearby hillside, the, demon, the demons beg Jesus, send us among the pigs. Allow us to go into them. First, they say, don't take us out the region because they know that he's going to cast them out of the man. They want to stay in the region. Let me tell you this. Demonic possession, here, here let me say this first. We see the greatest moves of God when we allow God to fill us by his spirit. If, if, if we... Human beings closed our hearts to God. Hear me, there'll be no move of God on earth. The move of God happens by us because he put his spirit in us. And the more we're filled by God's spirit, the more we are empowered. Okay? If we lock God out, the world becomes very dark. So, so the greatest manifestation of God is through us when we're filled by him. But this is true for the enemy. The greatest manifestation of the enemy is when he can possess God's creation. The enemy was always after our souls just as God was. And, and we see this in the beginning. Look, you're going to see a connection right here. They beg to stay in town. They say, man, we'll even take a pig. Why? Because they want to control the territory. And, and if they don't have a body, then they don't have power. This is why the enemy wants to possess us. It's like the power of God is released through us, and the enemy knows that his power is released through us where he can harm us. People who are demon-possessed harm themselves, and they could harm people. So this, that's his power to stay. And so they beg to stay in pigs. In the Garden of Eden in Genesis chapter 3, how did the enemy present himself to Eve and Adam? Through the snake, a serpent. It went into an animal to gain access to a person. This is how the enemy works. Whatever he can do to stay in town. And so he gave them the permission and the impure spirits came out and went into the pigs. But look what happens. The herd, about 2,000 in number, rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. And so they go into the pigs, and they're like, yes, we get to stay in town. People here love pigs. <laughs> you laugh at that, right? But read the story. The Bible says this, that the man was made whole, and the people who were around when they saw this, they went back to tell everybody else, and those same people went to Jesus, and they tried to push him out the town, because why? They, he, their, their pigs were lost. They cared more about the pigs than they did about the man. And the Bible says that the man was sitting there in his right mind. They made no mention of the great miracle. They just complained about their pigs. And so 
the demon's like, man, if we could stay in the pigs, we have access to the people. It's insane. But then what happens? The pigs throw themselves off the cliff, and that's it. Once the body dies, spirits are illegal. They can't stay in your body. When your body dies, your soul can't remain. It's going to go to heaven or it's going to go to hell. So, so it needs a body to be legal on earth. But once the pigs died, then the spirits had to go. Crazy stuff, right? What is this to say? Demons are looking to possess territories. This is why when you look certain countries, certain places, this land is bound with poverty. Spirits. They've taken over the region. This, one is, this town is filled with pride and gambling. It's a spirit of, uh, of bondage. This, this town is filled with homosexuality, sexual immorality. It, it's a bondage. It's, it, this is what the enemy is after, trying to gain territory. This is why Jesus commanded his disciples, go to the ends of the earth, preach the gospel, nation, go preach the gospel to the ends of the earth, baptize people, and heal the sick and cast out demons. To gain God's power back, this is what we need. Let me tell you this. We can never free Kissimmee if we can't be free right now. And, and it starts with us being free so that then when we can turn to the city and say, in the name of Jesus, and we start commanding for liberty to hit our city and liberty to hit our schools and freedom and deliverance to hit our communities. But it starts here. If we're in denial, then it'll never happen. And so when we pray... To cast demons and for people to set free, here's the other thing. We also have to pray. And, and, and look at it. We're going to do this. When we pray, we need to be, we got to do this. When we pray, unclean spirit come out, sickness come out, you have no permission to go into someone else. You have no, you have no, I give you no authority. Jesus said, they only went into the pits because he allowed them, but then they threw themselves off and then they had to go. So when we pray, pray. You have, we cast you out, and you cannot go into anyone else. You can't touch our children. You can't touch our homes. You can't touch my husband. You can't touch my wife. You can't touch my brother. You can't touch my sister. You must return to the pit of hell from where you came. All right. We're turning this into part two. That was extreme and obvious. But there are cases where they're extreme but subtle. I think this is the most extreme and subtle case. At the time of the Last Supper, Jesus tells his disciples, he goes, when are you going to betray me? When are you going to betray me? Now, we all know who it was. But you know why we know that? Not because Judas was foaming out the mouth. You don't, you don't know that, oh, I'm, I know it's Judas. I always knew it was him. No, you didn't. Because when Jesus said, when are you going to betray me, they all started to ask, is it me? You, none of them say, oh, it's Judas. His eyes be black. <laughs> I saw him talking, and his tongue looked like a snake. His head spun back. I know I saw it. No one knew it was Judas. <laughs> now, if we read, when you read, oh, my God, I'm going to show you the verse so you don't think I'm making stuff up here. John 13, verse 26. Jesus answered, it is one, look at this. So Jesus says, when are you going to betray me? They're like, who is it? Is it me? They don't, they don't know who it is. And he goes, it is the one to whom I will give this piece of bread, and when I have dipped it in the dish. Then dipping the piece of bread, he gave it to who? The son of Simon Iscariot. Look at this. Verse 27. As soon as Judas took the bread, Satan entered into him. I don't know what's worse. If they tell me, I'm sorry, you're going to be possessed today, you get legion or you get Satan, your pick. I don't know which would be worse. <laughs> but they're both terrible. They're both extreme. Satan entered into him. This is, this is demonic possession at its worst. Satan himself, not a demon, not an impure spirit, enters into Judas. And then Jesus says, so Jesus told him, what you, are going, what you are about to do, do it quickly. Look at this. But no one at the meal understood why Jesus said this to him. 
When Satan entered into him, his head didn't spin. He just started moving on the floor like a serpent. None of that. Jesus even said, the one who I give the bread to is going to betray me. And they're still like, there was no physical sign that he was not demon-possessed, Satan-possessed. That's how subtle it was. Why? Because when the enemy is trying to destroy the works of God, he does not want to be seen. Satan is not dumb. You know why there were so many? I was thinking about this. Why were there so many demon-possessed people all over during the time of Jesus? Because up until Jesus, no one had power and authority to cast them out. They weren't afraid. Go ahead, put chains on me. They break the chains. But when Jesus came to town, all of a sudden they're like, where did this guy come from? The son of God? And now they're shaking in their boots. But now... The name of Jesus is out. And Satan don't want to be found. Demons don't want to be found. So you know what they do? They stay quiet now. I mean, people come to church and we're bound either by sickness, tormented by spirits, and they sit there, chill. Let them get their worship on. I do not want to be seen. But today, in Jesus' name, you're going to be free because of the truth. You don't have to be foaming to be bound. To be free, you just need the truth, and you need to come to Jesus. Benji, help me. What you waiting for? (laughs) God told me there was a special anointing for freedom, healing, and deliverance today. Since I knew this was going to be the message, I was already praying. There ain't going to be no manifestations. There's no authority to speak. And while we were in prayer, we started, Benji started talking about it. It's like, holy cow, God's in this place. We start singing about it. Deliverance is nothing to be fearful of. And I want to tell you this. You, you don't need to be in shame. You just need to be honest and say, Lord, here I am. That's it. I grew up with a mother who believed in deliverance. I mean, she was rebuking demons out of us left and right. (laughs) My mom would be like, go to your room and pray. You need deliverance. (laughs) And I would go to my room and be like, I knew. Jesus, here I am. My My mama could sense I sinned. I try to hide it, but my mama knows. So I ask you to forgive me. Forgive me of my conscious sin. Forgive me of my unconscious sin. I repent of it. I need you. Come into my heart. And whatever came into me, whatever unclean, whatever has me bound, I renounce it. May I be free. And from a child, I was doing that. I wasn't scared. I knew the truth. The only thing that keeps us bound, one, is not having the knowledge, or two, not wanting to be free. We've eliminated one already. You have the knowledge now. There's no excuse. So the only thing that could stop you from being free today is you not wanting to be free. Now, now God, Jesus never changed a prescription. So today I'm going to invite every person that is dealing with some kind of bondage, sickness, disease. I'm going to invite you to come here. You might be struggling. Not struggling. You might be bound. With, with something, some type of sin. Sin. That's what Jesus told them. He said, yeah, you're, not, you're saying you guys are the sons of Abraham. You've never been bound. The one who sins is a slave to sin. You're bound. Some of us have given our lives to God, but we're still in sin. It's bondage. Now, there's another passage of scripture I didn't read, but it's important to read. Jesus said this. When an unclean spirit comes out of a man, I'm going to tell you where it's at, so you read it on your own. I have it. I'm not playing with you guys today. <laughs> God's not playing with us. This is the power of our salvation. Matthew chapter 12. Write it down. Matthew chapter 12. So you don't think I'm making this up. Matthew chapter 12 starting at verse 43. Jesus said this. When an unpure spirit comes out of a man, it'll go to dry places looking for rest. And if it doesn't find it, then it says, I'll return to the house I left. Remember I tell you this. when, When you come out of Egypt, Egypt always comes looking for you. That appetite. Be like, oh, you you really free? You sure you don't want to taste? The spirit says, I'm going to go back to where I came from. And if it finds the place, look at this, unoccupied. 
empty, swept clean, put in order. It appears to be in order, but it's empty. This is why when Jesus rebuked people, he didn't just cast them out, but he what? He esteemed them. He restored them. He filled them up. This is why when the, when the Israel uh, wanted to eat the food of Egypt, he said, no, I'm going to give you bread. I'm going to give you bread from heaven to fill you. So here's the problem. When an unclean spirit comes out of you, and today we're going to pray for you that you be set free, whether sickness or disease. After that, you need to fill, fill yourself up with God. Don't just be like, yeah, I got free, and then just continue living on normal. No, fill yourself up with the word of God. Jesus said, I am the bread that has come down from heaven. Jesus, the word, the, the, the Bible is our word of God. Fill yourself with that so that you stay not just free, but you stay full. It says this. When it finds that the house is unoccupied, swept clean, and put in order, then it goes and takes what? It's seven of the spirits more wicked than the first. And they go in and live there, and the final condition of that person is worse than the first. Demons are not dumb. They say, man, I was in here by myself. They kicked me out. If I'm going to go back, I need to bring my seven boys with me because when I was by myself, I got out. So I'm going to bring back more. But this is what I want you to know. Remember this. It's always harder. Every time you go back, it gets harder. Why does it get harder? Remember I told you that? Why every time I fall, it gets harder that time? Because guess what? When it came out the first time, it probably was one. But when it came out again and then it tried, now it's seven. Or eight. It takes seven other spirits more wicked than itself. Man, it just magnitude. It just magnified. This is why bondage is so hard to overcome. Because we keep going in and out with God. And Satan's like, man, I got I to gotta, I gotta fill him up with more. It's, you haven't noticed how also, too, a lot of our bondages has progressed? It started out being bound to this, and now we're bound to this, that, and the other. Seven spirits worse than the first. But here... Remember Legion, it did not matter, it was 5,000. Jesus' name still was enough power. So today I'm inviting you. Any kind of bondage, sickness, disease, headaches, fevers, muscle spasms, a report, cancer, bondage, mental oppression, anxiety, suicidal thoughts, lust, sexual immorality, Oh, there's a lot more. Pride, greed, low self-esteem, bondage, whatever it is. There's different levels. Bondage is bondage. Oh, there's still more. I'm going to pray right now that you would just look, 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 look. Just look at, internalize right now. Here's a chance to be free. Here's a chance to be free. God told me he's going to deliver people and he's going to fill people. That's what it means to rebuke a spirit. To cast out and to restore honor. He's going to cast out anxiety a spirit, but he's going to restore you with peace in Jesus' name. That's how good God is. He's going to take out shame. He's going to rebuke it. But as shame comes out, he's going to give you confidence in who he is and in his work. Sexual immorality is going to come out in exchange For righteousness in Jesus' name. For those people that have a sickness or a disease. In Jesus' name, it's going to come out today. And in exchange, he's going to give you health and wholeness. How many people believe that today? 
Today is your day to be free. I want to tell you right now, if there's something tormenting you, telling you that, no, it's not you, you know, it's just going to be another time. No, I rebuke that in Jesus' name. Freedom belongs to you. Deliverance belongs to you as a child and son of God. It is your right. And if you want this, it belongs to you. By what authority do we do this? In whose name we do this? We do this in Christ's name. And now I'm going to ask, I'm going to ask Pastor Tanya, where's Pastor Tanya at? Pastor Michael, where's Pastor Michael at? I'm going to ask uh, Ryan. Ryan, I want you here. Ryan, Pastor Michael, uh, Pastor Tanya, Linda. Where is Linda? Over here. I want that as we pray. Only these people. Only these people right now. If you did not pass to the front, then sit there and meditate. Extend your hands forward. But I don't want anybody else laying hands on someone else right now. Just pray on their behalf. But I want Pastor Michael, Pastor Linda, Pastor Tanya, Ryan, I want you to go. Just put your hands and declare them healed and then move on to the next person. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, here we are, Lord God. Father, you saved us by your blood. God, you were wounded for our, transgress for our transgressions. The chastisement of our peace was upon you. And by your stripes, we are healed, Lord God. We believe that the gospel saves people. We believe that the message of the cross, God, saves people, heals people, Lord God. And Father, right now we declare your power and your authority. You gave this to us, Lord God. And Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, as we lay hands, just begin to lay hands, as we just lay hands right now, Lord God, in agreement, Lord God, as we come, as these people come, Lord God, we're coming, Lord God, they're coming with sickness, with disease, with bondage, it does not matter with what they have come, the name of Jesus is more powerful, the name of God is above every name, Father, we thank you because it says this, that you, God, you have exalted him, you have given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven and those on the earth and those under the earth and that every tongue con should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father right now by the power of your son's name we declare these people to be whole to be healed any unclean spirit any sickness any disease must leave in Jesus name your name your name Jesus set them free right now they'll never be the same in Jesus' name, I declare you to be whole. I declare you to be healed. Set them free right now in the name of Jesus right now. Bring healing, liberation right now from oppression, Lord God, from pain, Lord God. Anything within their bodies, anything within their minds, anything that does not belong to you, Father, we declare them healed in Jesus' name. Right now, in Jesus' name. There was one time where Jesus' disciples went to pray for a boy who it says that because of an impure spirit, he experienced severe seizures. Not every person that suffers with seizures has an unclean spirit. But this boy, the unclean spirit, caused him to have such severe seizures that he would throw himself in fire, the Bible says, and in water. And his disciples went to try to cast out the unclean spirit, and they couldn't. And so when Jesus comes, they say, Lord, why couldn't we cast out the spirit? And Jesus said, this one does not come out except through prayer and fasting. Except through prayer and fasting. Before you try to rebuke spirits, and before you try to cast out sickness and disease... You need to make sure that you are close to God. You need to make sure that you, you have substance, a relationship of substance with God. I've seen people try to pray for other, for other people to be whole, and I've seen people lash out, manifestations, push back, spit on them, throw themselves all over the floor. I mean, been chaotic, and that person is not free. 
And it's because us, we're ignorant and we just pray for people without preparing ourselves and fasting and prayer. I wonder why God has led this church so deep into fasting and prayer. I wonder if this is why God led our first lady last year into fasting and prayer. I wonder if this is why God led me into fasting and prayer and many people. I wonder if this is why in the sin they made a call for the Jesus fast. I wonder if this is why you're fasting and praying because our fasting and our prayer would be empower us to bring deliverance and freedom to those that are bound. I declare you healed in Jesus' name. I declare you free in Jesus' name. We declare you free in Jesus' name. Father, I thank you. And you know what? Anything that comes out of these people, you have no right. You have no authority to enter in anyone else. Right now, Father, secure our children right now. Cover them by your blood. And right now, every evil spirit, every sickness and disease, you have no right in this church. You have no right in our city. We command you to leave this city in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, you have no right in our city. You have no right in our schools. You have no right. Any spirits that come out, you can't touch our children. You can't touch our teenagers. We come against you in Jesus' name. Jesus. You can't go in.